Wow, that was indeed a walk down memory lane, and we look forward to a, a, an event this year just as exciting as last. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us today from wherever in the world you happen to be. Oh, excuse me. My name is Jacqueline Scott. I'm the president-elect of the Union Internationale des Avocats, UIA, or the International Association of Lawyers. Today, we are delighted to welcome you to the 2023 Rule of Law Webathon Week, organized jointly by UIA IROL, which is the UIA's Institute for the Rule of Law, the American Bar Association International Law Section, the Human Rights Committee of AISIA, International Association of Young Lawyers, and the Inter-American Bar Association. The Rule of Law is society's legal underpinning guaranteeing human rights and creating economic opportunity and development. And we lawyers are often the first line of defense when the rule of law is under attack. For lawyers, the rule of law is not merely our stock in trade, it is our core value. And it is this universal commitment of all the world's lawyers to the rule of law that was the inspiration to join forces and launch this year's third annual one of a kind webathon and we're very proud to be part of it. This year's theme for the Webathon is Upholding the Rule of Law in Challenging Times. And the Webathon is composed of nine separate panels throughout the entire week that are dedicated to exploring, analyzing, and presenting perspectives on various challenges to the rule of law, including climate, economic, migration, security, and armed conflict crises, to name a few. This morning's panel, Surveillance Spyware Technologies Raise Alarm Bells, is the third of the nine Webathon panels and will focus on the impact on the rule of law of surveillance spyware technologies. <clears throat> Excuse me. As many of you know, in July 2021, the revelations about the widespread development of a spyware called Pegasus um, by dozens of governments targeting journalists, lawyers, human rights defenders, politicians, and government officials garnered widespread attention. The spyware scandal has continued to evolve with fur further revelations of illegitimate use and abuse of this technology against citizens and politicians across the world. International, regional, and national institutions all over the world have strongly reacted to these revelations. And extensive investigations have been initiated to assess and address these issues. A number of countries have actually opened criminal investigations into the use of the technology. <clears throat> Although Pegasus and other equivalent spyware technologies were supposedly designed to counter terrorism and crime, it is clear that their use and impact raised numerous grave questions. Further, there appears to be universal acknowledgement that our current laws and regulations are not appropriately equipped to effectively prevent 
and tackle the unprecedented challenges the use of such intrusive spyware poses to the rule of law. Today, our Pegasus panel of experts will provide us with a description of the issues raised by such spyware and speak about the impact of spyware on those who are targeted, including journalists. Our experts will also share with us the international legal framework in which the issues arise, and we'll hear specifically about court cases in the UK and how the British government is addressing rule of law infringements by spyware. Finally, our panelists will weigh in on what governments, citizens, and lawyers and bar associations in particular can and should be doing to protect against abuses of spyware. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our moderator, Grant Davis Denny, a litigation partner at Munger Tolls and Olson in Los Angeles, California, who serves as president of the UIA's Privacy and Rights of the Digital Person Commission. Grant, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, and thank you for all you have done to help organize the webathon this week. I would just ask the, the panelists to go ahead and uh, turn on their videos when they have a moment. I wanted to thank the International Association of, of Lawyers Institute for the Rule of Law, the American Bar Association's International Law Section, uh, the Human Rights Committee of IESIA, the International Association of Young Lawyers, and the Inter-American Bar Association for all the work that they have put in to organizing this week's uh, webinars, uh, webathons. <laughs> Welcome to the discussion uh, to all of you who are joining us uh, on surveillance spyware. Our panelists include experts in spyware, and data privacy in Europe and the Americas, and I hope you'll find this discussion to be very interesting. Let me start off by introducing uh, Sienna Anstis. Uh, she is a senior legal advisor at the Citizens Lab, an interdisciplinary laboratory at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Sienna and her colleagues at Citizen Lab have been leading researchers in investigating and documenting the use of surveillance spyware against members of civil society. Uh, Sienna holds a master's of law from the University of Cambridge and is currently completing a PhD in law with a focus on international legal regulation of transnational repression. Her work on digital uh, transnational repression has appeared in Lawfare, the Oxford Journal of Human Rights Practice and numerous other publications. Uh, welcome Sienna. I also want to introduce you to uh, Sofia Jaramillo. Uh, she is a senior staff attorney for civic space at the Robert F. Kennedy uh, Human Rights Organization, where she leads, coordinates, and supports the organization's work, partnering with human rights defenders in Latin America, Africa, and Asia to protect civic space through advocacy, strategic lit litigation, and technical assistance. Sophia previously served as a legal advisor to David Kay, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, while also lecturing and co-supervising the International Justice Clinic at the University of California at Irvine. At the regional level, she has served as a human rights specialist for two special rapporteurs for freedom of expression of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. She completed her uh, initial legal degree from Rosario University in Columbia, and she has also earned an LLM from Columbia Law School in New York. I welcome Sophia. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce you to Antoine Bernard, who is the Director of Advocacy and Strategic Litigation at Reporters Without Borders. He co-directs and teaches in the master's degree program on human rights and humanitarian action at the School of International Affairs at Sciences Po Paris. He previously served as CEO and uh, executive director of the International Federation of Human Rights Leagues and on the National Consultative Commission on Human Rights in France. I welcome to you, Antoine. Thanks for joining us. And finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Ian DeFreitas. Uh, he's a partner at Ferrer and Company in London. He leads uh, that firm's data, IP, and technology litigation team there. And he's dealt with a wide range of cases involving the unauthorized access and use of data. This includes the leading English Court of Appeal case in this area, as well as other high-profile cases, such as the construction workers' blacklisting litigation, 
and the fallout from the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Welcome, Ian. So let's get started. I want to jump right in. And uh, Sienna, I think I'm going to start with you and ask if you can provide us with sort of the basics on surveillance spyware technology, including what exactly do we mean by commercial surveillance software um, and spyware? How can it be installed? What can it do? Um, who makes it? What's it supposed to be for? Sort of the basics uh, to help us all uh, get on the same page. Thanks, Grant, Jacqueline, for the kind introduction. So I'll have a quick set of slides, and hopefully this will set a background for the rest of the discussion. So as you mentioned, I'll speak a bit about what the mercenary spyware industry is, what is mercenary spyware, and what are some of the impacts we're seeing on human rights. So we can skip ahead to the next slide and continue. So what is uh, spyware or more particularly mercenary spyware. So mercenary spyware is malicious software that allows an operator to gain access to, so hack a target's device and extract or modify data or information. That's a very simple definition. May also be referred to as intrusion software, offensive cyber capabilities, and the industry as a whole is sometimes referred to as providing um, access as a service. The use of the word mercenary in association with spyware indicates the willingness of companies in the market to sell their wares without concern for the potential use of such technology in human rights abuses. And it also underscores the role and the growing role of the private sector in developing and supplying spyware to government agencies, as well as in supporting their use of this technology through system setup, training, maintenance, support, and updates. So it goes beyond just the first part of the transaction, much like private security firms for hire. So installation of spyware relies on what we call software vulnerabilities or sort of errors in programming code that provide an entry point into the target's device. Um, for example, you might recall when WhatsApp informed over 100 civil society targets, and I believe approximately 1,400 targets overall, that they were targeted with Pegasus spyware back in 2019. By placing a WhatsApp call to a target device, malicious Pegasus code could be installed in the phone, even if the target never answered the call. So there are two types of infection vectors, so ways that the, the technology gets on the phone. So the first may be socially engineered links that tempt or confuse targets into clicking. Um, for example, an invitation to this conference that the operator would know you would likely be interested in attending and would be tempted to click on, which then um, continues the process of the spyware installation. But more recently, we're seeing a growth in what we call zero-click exploits, um, which facilitate installation of spyware with no action by the targeted device owner at all. And um, this is particularly concerning because such attacks are even harder to detect by the phone user who has no indication that something might be wrong. Um, we can move to the next slide. So with that background in mind, what are the actual capabilities of mercenary spyware? So mercenary spyware is a very powerful piece of malware that can allow full access to the targeted device. This means that all the content of a phone becomes accessible to the operator, implicating, of course, not only the targeted device owner's communications, but also anyone who communicates with them. So two examples. A successful infection with NSO Group's Pegasus spyware is known to provide access to the contents of the targeted user's device, such as access to information stored in apps, including end-to-end -end encrypted apps, contact lists, access to audio and video, turning on um, the microphone, call logs, and so on. Uh, another more recent example um, is that of Kendiru, where technical analysis has shown that it provides extensive access to a targeted device. For example, file extraction, browser content, stealing messages in Signal, using the target's cloud accounts to send and post messages. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so who buys and sells this technology? So mercenary spyware is made and sold by companies or developed and sold by companies that operate in a highly secretive and lightly regulated marketplace, which is part of the reason why we're um, we're having the issues we're having today. We have we don't have a great sense of numbers because the lack of transparency and the lack of regulation around around this industry. So from what we do know so far, these companies operate primarily in a business to government framework where private sector actors contract with government institutions and agencies, often through third-party companies that facilitate the sale. A recent number I saw from Carnegie's Global Inventory of Commercial Spyware and Digital Forensics shows that between 2011 and 2023, at least uh, 74 governments contracted with commercial firms for spyware and digital forensic technology. I suspect um, 
there's like I said that there's no there's a complete lack of transparency in the market, meaning it's very hard to collect um, this this data. Uh, so far, companies have been reported to be selling from a wide range of countries, from Italy, Cyprus, Israel, Austria. Uh, in cases where there have been in-depth investigations into corporate structures, we have seen that companies employ a complex structure, including multiple corporate entities that make it difficult to track, for example, what jurisdiction they are exporting from and whether they are complying with the rules. Further, companies like NSO Group have sold their products to private companies in the recipient state, which then contract with um, the government intended end user. An interesting part of the mercenary spyware marketing um, the strategy justification used by companies is that sales are only made to government clients. The argument goes something like selling to government clients means that the government client will be responsible in their end use of the technology. There is no potential human rights issues to address and companies can sort of wash their hands of the problem. We know this is just not the case. Um, and finally, mercenary spyware clients are diverse from authoritarian states, Saudi Arabia, for example, um, to more democratic states, say Germany, buying this technology. The growing proliferation um, of the spyware industry, i.e. more and more companies operating in the space, means that more and more governments are able to access this technology. Technical know-how is no longer a barrier um, for governments who want to have this kind of technology at their disposal and often for repressive purposes, um, as long as they have money to spend. Next slide, please. So I'll just quickly review some of the impacts in human rights defenders, and I think my colleague Sophia and others will further unpack that in more specific context. Um, so how is spyware used against human rights defenders? In our work at the Citizen Lab, we have seen that spyware enables authorities to target human rights defenders both domestically and transnationally. So targeting um, individuals that they seek to silence both at home and abroad in what we call digital transnational repression. Uh, and the technology can be used against human rights defenders or other members of civil society in many ways. And this, this may be obvious, but it's, it's uh, I think looking at this list gives you a good sense of how dangerous this technology can be. So finding a human rights defender's location or that of their contacts, um, accessing contact lists to uncover and track the target and other activists, collecting information to be used as evidence in criminal prosecutions or even in torture um, or interrogation, planting incriminating evidence, accessing personal information to then blackmail and intimidate the targets. So now I'll talk about a few uh, specific examples. We can move to the next slide. <clears throat> Thank you. So Lujain Halathul uh, is a Saudi human rights defender and activist for the rights of women and girls in Saudi Arabia. She actually filed a lawsuit against Dark Matter, an Emirati cyber surveillance company um, and American citizens who work for the company with the support of EFF. It's very interesting. Lawsuit, if you if you want to sort of get a sense of what the what the parameters of this complaint are, you can find it on EFF's website. Uh, this complaint details that Al Hafloul was arbitrarily detained by Emirati security services and forcibly rendered to Saudi Arabia, where she was then interrogated, tortured, and sexually assaulted. She argues that she was hacked prior to this by Dark Matter, um, one of the, the company that she's suing. During interrogation and torture, interrogators then brought up details related to confidential communications on her device, showing, like I said above, sort of how, um, how human rights defenders are impacted and targeted through spyware. Uh, she was also subject to a trial in the Specialized Court of Saudi Arabia, and the charging document referred to her private communications, including with other human rights activists. After her release, her phone was then again, I was then targeted with Pegasus. Um, so the next example is the enforced disappearance of Paul versus Sabagina. Now we can move to the next slide. So Paul versus Sabagina has been a longtime critic of the Rwandan government. Uh, he was forcibly disappeared in August 2020 after he traveled to Dubai from the US. The Rwandan government announced that he was then in their custody at the end of August 2020. He actually recently made it back to the US after significant efforts by his family and pressure from the US government. Um, a little glimmer of good news and all the bad news. Uh, in 2021, it was revealed that his daughter, Karine Kanimba, was on the Pegasus Project list. Um, and Amnesty International confirmed that her phone had been attacked with Pegasus multiple times. Kanimba was at the forefront of her efforts to get her father released from Rwanda custody and was having numerous discussions with government officials as well as her lawyers uh, during this time. And much of that would have been happening through electronic communications um, from her device. And in an interview, she described how the hacking of her phone provided insight into her communications with her and her father's lawyers, as I mentioned, forced her, and more broadly, forced her to change her personal habits, let her, and led her to be extremely concerned for her physical 
um, safety and security, uh, even though she was outside Rwanda. And finally, the, the, the last case study I wanted to mention was the uh, shocking murder of Jamal Khashoggi, um, uh, who was murdered in the uh, Saudi consulate in Turkey uh, in October 2018 by the Saudi authorities. So in July 2021, news broke that his uh, wife, Hanan Halater, was actually targeted with Pegasus spyware before his murder. The targeting happened between November 2017 and April 2018, and recall he was murdered in, 2000, um, in October 2018. Hatice Senjis, his fiance, also had her phone targeted with Pegasus spyware <clears throat> in the days leading up to the assassination. And we found at the Citizen Lab that Omar Abdulaziz, a close associate of Khashoggi and also a Saudi dissident living in Canada, was also found to have been uh, infected with Pegasus spyware in 2018 prior to Khashoggi's murder. Um, I think this is a really interesting example because the target may not necessarily be the human rights defender who's being um, pursued by, by a government, but maybe their associates or individuals who are around them in order to gain information um, and an insight into what that person is. The, 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 the primary target is planning. Uh, and finally, I'll just talk a little bit about the targeting of lawyers, which is very much a part of this um, of this uh, of this issue. So lawyers have also been a target uh, of spyware operators, in particular when working on sensitive issues uh, such as human rights or corruption, or where they have clients working on these issues. Um, just a few examples. There are many, many more, but I'll just I'll keep it brief. Uh, Arnon Nampa, <laughs> a leading human rights lawyer in Thailand whose work includes defending activists accused of les majesté under Thai law. Um, the Citizen Lab reported that Arnon was infected with Pegasus spyware multiple times uh, throughout 2020 and 2021. We also saw lawyers working on targeted killings in Mexico being the target of spyware. Um, for example, lawyers working with an organization called Centro Prod, uh, which represents families of disappeared students, was targeted with Pegasus spyware. <clears throat> and finally, another example is Hala Ahadib, a Jordanian law and human rights defender who is also infected with Pegasus and working on human rights issues. I mean, it probably goes without saying, but uh, the targeting of lawyers with spyware is especially problematic because it makes it incredibly difficult to provide legal services if nothing can be assumed to be confidential, um, unless you sort of meet with, with no phones and in, in a certain circumstance, which is just not realistic. Um, and it really hits at the core of the lawyer-client relationship. And I think we'll hear a bit more as well um, about uh, how journalists are impacted by spyware, which I think is also a very interesting area of study um, because of the importance of protecting sources in the context of that relationship. And uh, next slide. So how does spyware impact the work of human rights defenders? Uh, it renders it practically impossible for human rights defenders to undertake the sensitive work they do in safety and in privacy. Um, so human rights defenders are already taking significant risks in the work they do, and this is just further enhanced by the fact that they may lose um, any, any sense of privacy in doing this work. It exposes not only them, but also their networks, but also people who aren't engaged in human rights work, but are close to them, for example, family or, or friends or, or other colleagues. Uh, it significantly increases, as I mentioned, the risk for human rights defenders and for their networks due to the possibility of location tracking, for example, uh, the danger of planted evidence, the exposure of networks, and so on. Um, and even the possibility that spyware could be used against human rights defenders can lead to behavioral modifications and chilling effects on freedom of speech and assembly, an issue I think that David Kay has discussed um, as former special rapporteur. And further, uh, there's growing research showing that it causes serious psychological and mental um, impacts. <laughs> and the impacts for women human rights defenders are particularly uh, severe. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry, there's no more slides, but I wanted to mention um, on the last point, there have been multiple uh, women human rights defenders who have had their phones hacked over the past few years, another area which I think deserves particular study. Um, the impacts are, are, are particularly traumatic for women who are likely to be severely disadvantaged in the broader society in which they're working. For example, leaking private information um, of, a, of a woman living in countries with particularly discriminatory practices and laws against women will likely subject her to far more public scrutiny, uh, if not criminal prosecution or worse than a male counterpart. Um, and to close with the words of Ebsam al a uh, Bereni women, women's human rights defender who described the impact of being targeted with spyware in an interview with Axis Now, personal freedoms are over for me. They no longer exist. I'm not safe at home, on the street or anywhere. 
So hopefully that provides a helpful general introduction to the issue of spyware and opens this up for a rich discussion with my colleagues. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, Sienna. Thank you so much for giving us that introduction to the issues. Um, I just had a, a follow-up question for you I wanted to ask real quick before we uh, lose you from the camera. That is, um, I, I'm sure it's hard to know for certain given all the secrecy surrounding commercial spyware, but do we have any sense of how many people have been targeted with it? I mean, is it is it sort of in the dozens? Is it hundreds? No. Is it yeah, no, it's it's an interesting, it's a good question. So I think hundreds plus um, when we're talking civil society and probably more if we're talking more more generally. Um, so definitely in the hundreds. Um, it's because of the challenges in detecting spyware on your phone. I think we are seeing like a very small, like the tip of the iceberg and there's sort of everything else is sort of um, underneath it. So I think hundreds is probably a very conservative estimate, but there have um, we're looking at least those those kind of figures. And I think maybe it's also important just to point out that it's not just the targeting um, and having your phone targeted and infected that's really sort of an issue when it comes to freedom of expression, but also just the threat of it. So if you know your government um, that you criticize, for example, has access to this technology and increasingly governments do, as I pointed out, because it's becoming um, something you can just buy off the shelf that alone can have a chilling effect on the work of human rights defenders. And I think that's that's truly, truly scary as well. Got it. And one other question for you, Sienna, where are, where's this commercial spyware made, this really sophisticated type that can, you know, go in and take control of microphones and cameras on phones? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, NSO group is based in Israel. It's a very common example. Um, and then, I mean, it, it the spyware goes from from before the the development of spyware goes from before NSO group. So another example, for example, is Hacking Team, um, which was based in Italy, but I think was spun into a different uh, company called Memento Labs. I'm not sure what the status is. Then there's been reports of spyware companies um, in Austria. Um, my understanding is Cyprus is also a hub for this. So it's pretty, it's pretty varied, um, which I think we'll get to a point we need to discuss later, but there needs to be sort of international, not sort of, there needs to be international coordination around the issue of spyware if so many jurisdictions are involved, um, or at least sort of tacitly supporting the, the development of that technology within their jurisdictions and just issuing export licenses or turning a blind eye to companies that are supposed to get export licenses from their respective jurisdiction and just not enforcing that requirement. Great, thank you very much. I also wanted to note for the audience that if you have questions along the way, uh, you are free to put your questions in the question and answer box on Zoom. You should find at the bottom of your screen a button that says Q&A. If you click on that and then type in your questions, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on those and I will try and share those with, with the panelists. So next, I'd like to turn to Antoine Bernard, who I introduced earlier, but I'll just remind you uh, that he is a report with Reporters Without Borders. And Antoine, I'm, I'm hoping you can talk to us a little bit about what we know uh, regarding the use of commercial surveillance spyware against um, reporters and journalists. Uh, what have we learned so far about that? Sure, sure, Grant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you all for the invitation. Uh, very happy to be here, to be with you alongside my, my colleagues and uh, building from Siena's earlier presentation, which was very exhaustive. Uh, maybe to, to share with you a few of our uh, understanding and adaptation to that growing phenomenon of, uh, of uh, surveillance uh, technologies and practices. In the field of journalism, uh, Sina has referred to some of the key examples and referred to Hatice Cengiz, the, the, the wife of uh, journalist Jamal Hashoji, who was uh, killed, tortured, dismembered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul uh, a few years ago. And his wife, Hatice, had been spied with Pegasus indeed months before his murder. But um, uh, beside our many cases, more or rather less famous, however, very numerous, 
many cases have came up of journalists who have been surveilled uh, in uh, in Morocco or working on Morocco from exile. Uh, the case of Omar Radi, who was spied with Pegasus spyware, is one of the most famous. This case was revealed by Amnesty uh, three years ago, and and just after that revelation, all of a sudden, an investigation for espionage was opened against him. Uh, and also uh, a case of alleged rape was forged against him. Uh, and he was sentenced uh, on appeal to six years in prisons uh, in prison last year. Um, yeah, he's one of the laureates of many awards, including RSF's award for independence last uh, December. Another very, very famous case in, in Morocco is Hisham Mansouri. Uh, whose uh, phone, uh, smartphone was infected, uh, it seems, more than 20 times between February and April 2021. Uh, but there are many other ones. We, we spoke of Pegasus. We can speak of another famous uh, device now, uh, which is called Predator. Uh, and the Predator has emerged, including in a democratic country, an EU member state, Greece, with many cases, at least 13 journalists uh, of all kinds of media outlets have been targeted in, in Greece. The most famous ones being Yanis Kurtakis or Tanasis Koukakis. Um, one very uh, common, of course, common uh, commonality between all those cases is that they've been investigating or reporting on very uh, sensitive public interest issues. Now, the consequences um, are special for journalists, like I guess they are for, for lawyers. For one key reason, confidentiality, i.e. a kind of privileged relation, uh, lawyers, clients, but with journalists as journalist sources, with sources, is absolutely key to the performance of their, of their uh, activity. Um, there is a, because of the emergence and development of such uh, surveillance practices, a move from, at least in democratic societies for journalists, a move from a relative certainty to a total uncertainty. Uh, uh, and um, uh, one aspect actually uh, of that uncertainty is that uh, journalists need to be ready to be under surveillance not only from private actors, but also from state agencies. And in democratic societies, that means from the very ones who are entrusted with protecting journalism. So that really is uh, um, a, a very important uh, uh, development, all in all considering uh, how many states in the world do present an environment a good environment for press freedom and the practice of journalism. And those are fewer and fewer. Uh, uh, CF, the, the last World Press Freedom Index by, by RSF. Now, the consequences are on journalists' own safety. Uh, I illustrated with Morocco in the case of Omar Radi, but in all authoritarian regimes, uh, the use of surveillance against journalists leads directly to arrest. Uh, arbitrary detention, uh, uh, arbitrary conviction, uh, jail, imprisonment, if not worse. Uh, it has consequences on journalists' protection, legal security, as, as I said, but also on the very safety of their sources. And this practice puts at risk sources, i.e. the backbone of journalism, meaning the exercise of journalism itself is affected by those practices. It may lead uh, at best to a type of self-censorship uh, and, and it's not nothing, self-censorship on very sensitive issues uh, um, uh, which, and uh, um, uh, in any case uh, calls for a very, very sophisticated precautionary measures, anticipating that surveillance is the rule, is the principled practice, instead of being uh, uh, the exception. It has accordingly consequences on the social function of journalism and beyond on, on democracy. Just figuring out one last word, that surveillance most of the time does not come alone. 
It comes combined with other practices. Take, for instance, slaps. The development of slaps, of the lawfare, unduly targeting journalism for the legitimate exercise of their function and will lead to having journalists spending more time self-protecting and self-defending in court than reporting on public interest issues. All this in a global context of lack of appropriate regulation, we will come to it, and total impunity, total lack of accountability. One absolutely key aspect uh, in that respect being the extreme difficulty to attribute the crime, the lack of imputability because of the type of technique that is being used. So that's, let's say, the complementary frame to the one uh, put by Siena as applied to, to, to journalists. But I, I can't stay here without, if you allow me, Grant, um, just reflecting on the way we at RSF World well with all our networks, offices, bureaus, uh, uh, stakeholders uh, have been uh, trying to adapt to, to that. And it's, trying to, it's, it's an ongoing and permanent adaptation because we're learning every day. The first reaction was that uh, obviously we need it and we do need to be much more performant, much better uh, in our own self-protection. That's absolutely, self-protection means being better at training, uh, being better at partnershiping and, and being equipped with the proper uh, devices for communication, for storage, for transmission of uh, information. Uh, it means also being equipped to <clears throat> take our part in the uh, forensic analysis. Uh, we've created in RSF a digital security lab, which is very modest, yet uh, uh, to be able to share best practices, share understanding on, uh, on, on the developments, keep up to date and, and feed the global analysis. And I want at this stage really to pay tribute to the work that has been done by Citizen Lab and by the Amnesty Lab also, uh, th that really helped us move basically from one century to the other on, in, in our understanding of the, of the scope of the phenomenon. Uh, it means also getting better internally in our own staffing and organization, uh, upgrading our equipment. Uh, RSF has created a, a, a position and, and a team uh, for digital security and operations uh, uh, after uh, the, the, the Pegasus scandal in particular. Now, the second reaction is that we will certainly, certainly not stay passive and just contribute to counting the cases and denouncing them. Especially in RSF, we've developed a fighting back litigation strategy. We've decided to, uh, to really try to to challenge the impunity uh, uh, situation in those cases, uh, articulated with a number of colleagues uh, uh, in the world to, to see who would try to do what in what legal forum. Um, and on our side, we'll put together uh, uh, quite a number of, uh, of cases from the Pegasus scandal, uh, uh, 25 actually, 25 uh, journalists from, 20, from 10 countries. And we filed a criminal lawsuit, a criminal complaint, but under the civil law system as a civil party in France, uh, in the name of those 25 uh, journalists from, uh, from 10 countries, France, Morocco, Azerbaijan, Spain, Hungary, India, Togo, Mexico, Rwanda, and Belgium, to be able to, uh, uh, to, to look for, one, the opening of a preliminary investigation, second, as a civil party, to, to have the designation of an investigating judge, which was uh, eventually uh, uh, done and decided. Uh, um, and that judge has been uh, uh, working uh, since 1st January 2022. Um, we just got the news today, actually, that the uh, uh, infection, Pegasus infection, had been confirmed in a number of the cases we submitted, uh, cases of journalists, in addition to which, instructed by the same judge, have been confirmed cases of surveillance of French uh, uh, officials 
including the news came today, the former Minister of Defense herself. Uh, so there is a big case uh, here that uh, uh, fortunately, we don't know how, how far it will be able to go, but fortunately until now has been developing uh, positively, whereas our understanding, and we'll hear more from, more from, from you and Jan uh, later on, uh, it has been, it seems to have been difficult in any case in many countries or many countries or even not possible. Lastly, um, our reaction has been to try to be much more involved and, uh, and to perform much better uh, in, uh, in our regulation advocacy. We need strong regulation and regulation is very poor. It has many, many loopholes. Uh, and it's uh, obviously not strong enough. So it goes from general advocacy to uh, more EU-focused advocacy for legal developments. We'll go back to here. I don't want to be too long at this stage and unless you have further questions, but um, the um, uh, EU um, regulation uh, uh, objectives include now the Euro having good and strong provisions in the European Media Freedom Act between now uh, be, be being now negotiated in, uh, in, uh, in the European Parliament and with the EU member states and the European Commission. So there may be here a little hope, but uh, you'll give me the opportunity to come back to that, uh, I hope, later on. Grant. Great. We will definitely get back to that subject. I, I do have one question for you, Antoine, which is, I wonder if you've had a chance to speak with uh, or hear from uh, journalists who have been victims of this spyware and and just the impact that it has on them personally, psychologically to, you know, know that someone has had access to their their phone's microphone or their their camera or I, I understand that it definitely impacts their ability to um, communicate with sources and the like, but on a on a more personal and psychological level, can you give us a sense of what this is really like to be a victim of this type of uh, software? Yeah, sure. Uh, at a minimum, I can I can refer to the conversation that I had with the 25 uh, journalists who have joined RSF in the filing of that criminal complaint uh, coming from uh, from 10 countries. Um, uh, it's hard to 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 be general and and reflect from all of them, but the the the, the global sense of the conversation was one: we are not surprised, even though second. Wow, that's really big to be to be so easy to to implement and operate on 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 our devices. Uh, uh, third, we're we're certainly not victims; we're right holders, uh, uh, and we want to uh, and we want to to make this uh, uh, recognized, understood, and measures taken accordingly. Uh, if I would summarize that, the global move, let's say. Uh, but but clearly, um, um, uh, support, backup is needed. I was going to say uh, uh, proxies, so proxies, but I mean, independent judges and prosecutors and investigators are badly needed uh, to, to overcome that situation. Uh, we need, we need fair trials before independent court and final conviction or final judicial decision in such conditions to be taken. And until now, such has not been the case. So it's uh, uh, th that's a real, um, let's say, sh common and shared uh, uh, feeling by all journalists that we've been working with uh, on such cases. Got it. One other question, I'm not sure if this is a better question for you, Antoine, or for Sienna, but uh, people may wonder, given all the secrecy that surrounds the use of this spyware, how has it come to light? How do we know who has been targeted and, and uh, you know, uh, that has, has been infected? Sienna, maybe you can, you can refer a little to, to that. Oh, whoops, Sienna, do you mind you're, going You're muted. Oh, sorry, um, I can respond with the caveat, I'm a lawyer, not a technologist. So for sort of a more sort of forensic answer, you should speak to my colleagues. But 
One of the first cases, um, the first case of uh, Pegasus targeting, I believe, was Amin Mansour, which is um, he's a human rights uh, defender from the UAE, and that was sort of the patient zero. Um, and from there, various techniques have been used um, to, for example, um, employ fingerprinting techniques to sort of follow where the spyware is going. Um, and what we do, um, just to speak a bit about the lab's research methods now, um, we uh, operate sort of a, what we call under the a research ethics framework at the University of Toronto. So we enroll people into a research study. Um, and from there, we're able to check their devices. And my colleagues have developed different methods to identify um, when a phone has been targeted with spyware or targeted and infected with a spyware. Um, I think a lot of this work relies on human rights defenders and civil society activists um, who are particularly likely targets by government operators to come forward and to ask for their devices to be to be reviewed and for journalists as well. And sort of from those from that um, forensic uh, research and from that interaction that we can get a better sense of who has been targeted or not. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Well, let's uh, turn our focus a little bit now from, um, you know, describing the the challenge and, and, and issues that we're facing to uh, discussing a little bit how uh, governments have have reacted to this. And, and I want to start at the international level with uh, Sophia. Um, Sophia, I guess if, if you could start by telling us a little bit about how, you know, international agencies, be it at the United Nations or uh, EU Parliament, um, other international organizations have, have reacted to this issue, which does seem to have a lot of cross-border aspects to it from where the companies are located who are selling this software to uh, the ability of governments who purchase this software to target journalists, human rights activists, lawyers, and other members of civil society, regardless of where they're at in the world. Um, so if you could sort of introduce us to, to that landscape, what's going on at the international level, I think that would be helpful. Sure, thank you. Um, well, first, thank you for uh, Grant and Jacqueline for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with my co-panelists. It's an honor to be next to, to them. Um, so yes, at the international level, there has been a lot of different, um, different reactions to surveillance, both at the political level and at the UN, and the human rights bodies at the UN or regional, uh, or regional level. They have sounded the alarms uh, about the spyware, about spyware for years, right? Like they've addressed the issue of surveillance for years, even, um, yeah. So like the UN General Assembly uh, and the Human Rights Council, they have repeatedly stated that member states of the UN should refrain from un like unlawful or arbitrary surveillance. and. Um, UN Special Rapporteurs, those are like independent experts on specific thematic issues or countries. They've expressed their like very, very strong criticism on surveillance. They've highlighted the dangers. They, they talked about the incompatibility of some of these spyware tools with international human rights laws. Yes, like, and, and just to name a few, like the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Express, Opinion and Expression, David Kay, he issued a report in 2019 on targeted surveillance. I'll talk a little bit about that report because it, and I think, and Sienna mentioned that report a little bit too. Um, he issued a report on this, uh, on this specific subject, but like uh, rapporteurs, UN rapporteurs on extrajudicial executions and yes, Calamar, for example, when she was investigating, when she was doing the, her inquiry into the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, she also mentioned what Sienna uh, the, a little bit of the overview of what Sienna mentioned. So she also condemned the use of spyware. She also called for a moratorium, joined David Kay in calling for a moratorium on the use and sale of, of spyware. So it has been a lot of different, um, yeah, a lot of different um, statements, thematic reports and analysis on the threat of, of surveillance. I would say that even in 2012, the previous, the then rapporteur at the time issued a report on surveillance, but it was more of like um, 
massive uh, surveillance. Like, yeah, so it, it was it was like the issue of surveillance as a whole, it has been at the UN at the regional level also, like very much there. Just to um, even, and just going a little bit forward without going into details, like last August, the previous human, um, High Commissioner for Human Rights at the UN, she published a report, she submitted a report to the Human Rights Council. And among other things, she's also said that spyware like Pegasus is incompatible with human rights. It has gone a little bit further. Um, so for the first part of your question, yes, they've said a lot of the, they've issued reports, they've issued uh, recommendations. And what into the, what have they said? Um, I think, as I mentioned, I will focus on the 2019 report. And um, I think I will focus more on like the legal standards that are applicable to this type of conversation. Just a little layout, it might be a little bit nerdy, but I know I'm among lawyers also. And, and um, excuse me, for some of you, this might be some, something very obvious, very general. Um, but some of you might not have that knowledge of international human rights law, so I'll go just, I'll take a little bit of a step back, a step back and talk about, uh, yeah, the legal standards. Um, so both Sienna and Antoine provided us with this comprehensive overview of the nature of the problem, right? Like we understand now the capabilities of spyware, we know about the specific impacts that have on surveillance, and both touched a little bit about the impacts on their rights to privacy and freedom of expression. Um, one of the first things that I just want to note, and Sienna touched upon this, is that because of what has been published by academics, because of what has been published by journalists, because of leaks uh, of information that has given us a little bit more awareness of, of what's happening of the landscape of surveillance, people now, as it compares to 20 years ago, are a little bit more, um, the, we understand more, and the general public, we understand more of the implications and what the, the, this surveillance implicates real fundamental human rights, right? Um, and I'm going to reference, and it's a bunch of them. It's not just privacy. It's not just freedom of expression. It can be freedom of association, assembly. It, the, we talked about the implications on the right to life because of uh, what it can actually end up in the killing of a journalist or a human rights defender. We've also talked about uh, rule of law. We've talked about due process. So it's a, it's a bunch of different implications of human rights. And I will focus just on the first three, the most obvious, and to have a little bit of continuity uh, in the conversation. So, and I will also frame it a little bit on the, just the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, because it gives uh, a more global framework of these issues, but we have similar provisions at the regional levels, both at the inter-American, European and African context. So uh, if we start talking about the right to privacy, so, and this is all set up in this report from 2019. Um, if we start with the right to privacy, Article 17.1, it guarantees as a, as a basis of human dignity and integrity, that no one shall be, shall be subjected to arbitrary un, of unlawful or unlawful interference with the right to privacy, family, home, or correspondence, right? The target of surveillance, as Sienna mentioned, and she mentioned it very well, like um, the target of surveillance doesn't need to have knowledge of the attempted or the successful intrusion uh, of, of spyware or surveillance for there to be an interference with the right to privacy. Just um, yeah, it doesn't. Ha they don't have to have knowledge for that right to be, um, yeah, restricted. Privacy also uh, includes the ability of individuals to determine who holds that information, who holds information about them, and how that information is used. Um, then a little bit, and it, in the digital sphere, privacy and freedom of expression are interconnected, and privacy guarantees the exercise of freedom of expression too. And just think about like what the privacy that we need in order to communicate, that to feel safe to communicate with others, to express uh, information between family members. Just like that, the right to privacy enables that uh, the right to freedom of expression. And 
Um, we have Article 19 of the ICCPR, and it has two rights, two different rights. The right to free, the, the right to hold opinions and the right to freedom of expression. The right to hold opinions is very, very interesting. I think we need to analyze it a little bit more, but the right to hold opinions is an absolute right. It's one of these rights in the ICCPR that says that everyone has the right to hold opinions without interference. It doesn't allow any type of restrictions. And um, if we could distill a little bit that right a little bit more about what is it to hold opinions and in the digital in the digital sphere, sphere what that means like holding an opinion is all, it might also be related to accessing information but also just think about what you what you write on your notepad or your notes in your cell phone if you're writing what you're thinking like you're actually you're writing you're not expressing it to anyone else but you're writing what you're holding your opinions and it's that part if that right is interfering, if that if everyone has access to everything that you have on your phone, even though you're expecting it to be private, like we can still analyze the right to freedom of to hold opinions there. Um, that's a lot a longer conversation, and it could be an academic one also. But moving on into Article 19.2 of the ICCPR, that's the right to freedom of of expression. Um, the provision at the ICCPR says that like everyone has the freedom to of expression that is the freedom to seek receive and impart information and ideas of all kinds regardless of frontiers to your point grant that it doesn't matter where uh, it's regardless of frontier and you have that in a provision that was drafted decade, decades ago right so it, it is it is uh, a comprehensive um, understanding of freedom of expression we have a a variety of, of case law, international case law and regional case law that distills a little bit of what that right encompasses. But um, when we're talking about spyware and both pan previous panelists, both of them talked about how it interferes with freedom of expression when talking about human rights defenders and journalists, but it like spyware interferes with this right as the actual or perceived imminent threat of like the retaliation that they might have for expressing information or for um, just that threat of being surveilled, the threat of surveillance can incentivize in individuals, journalists or not, human rights defenders or not, just a lot of people can incentivize them to self-censor, to check a lot more of what they're actually writing, what they're actually expressing, who they're, who they're communicating with, who they, this threat of surveillance might prevent them to express their ideas, to even access information, even searching uh, something on a, on a web browser, that might prevent them. So that exercise of just even receiving information, accessing information, doing research, academic research even, um, it, it, it can be chilled, it can be prevented, it can be inhibited. And Antoine did an amazing job talking about like the, even the contacting of sources, for, for journalists and even just talking a little bit more general about what that encompasses uh, of the, the restrictions to freedom of expression and to, well, to journalists in particular. Um, so we have those three rights and just for the protection of human rights, the ICCPR usually sets like a, a, a around, uh, I would say like three, three sets of, public, of state obligations. The first one, it talks about refraining from violating human rights. The second one, preventing human rights interference of third parties, such as private actors or other states. And the third one, to provide remedies to victims of human rights violations, right? And to the first one, uh, just the refraining of violating human rights, when we are talking about privacy and freedom of expression, they share a common or a very close common set of standards that requires the state to meet us like a specific test we talk about the three-part test like the test of legality necessity and proportionality and legitimacy yeah um just grant tell me if i'm talking too long i get excited about these issues and i can just uh, more <laughs> uh no, talk a lot yeah, about this, this is but... great this is great I, um, one, one question sophia i do have and in, and in, in you might be about to address this but are, are the so the ICCPR, that's the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, are these enforceable by individuals who have, who have been targeted with surveillance spyware? Or are these sort of lofty norms that are out there, but 
uh, governments can sort of violate them with impunity? Well, it is, I, I think ICCPR might be the international covenant might be one of the most ratified treaties that we have. So states have voluntarily uh, submitted themselves to their to the provisions of those treaties. They ratified the treaties. They have state obligations, so they're bound by th those. Right? There are different ways in which um, states can implement international standards into their local uh, jurisdictions, whether it's a, a provision in their constitution or by law, or like it. It, it has different ways in which international norms can be implemented internally. Um, that's one set, like just like the interpretation that whether it's regional or at the, uh, the Human Rights Committee, how they've interpreted the provisions of the treaty, um, courts, can, courts can see that interpretation and apply that internally. Some mm -hmm. countries, some states do that better than others. Some states, I won't, I won't like some states will reject just the the idea of incorporating human rights norms into their own uh, into their own rulings, for example, if we're talking about courts, but others, if you see the Colombian Constitutional Court, the Mexican Court, uh, a lot of countries in Latin America, for America, for example, and even at the European level, this is a lot more uh, also uh, developed given the European Court of Human Rights standards and how courts have interpreted, and that's a different set of provisions, but. Yeah, so states have voluntarily um, subjected themselves to the rules and to just they voluntarily ratify those treaties and their obligations. Um, so yes, and and what I'm saying is that at, like you have that at local level, but also you can go uh, to the Human Rights Committee, to a, one of the UN treaty bodies and bring up a case, an individual petition. At the regional system, once you exhaust local remedies also, you can go to the regional mechanisms like to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights or to the court and at the Af and African level, same, you have the regional and sub-regional courts and at the European level also, you have the European Court of Human Rights. So you have different ways of incorporating like human rights standards and apply, uh, yeah, abiding by those rules. So um, I'll quickly mention um, some of the standards when we're talking about um, restrictions to uh, freedom of expression and and privacy and these standards basically requires the state to meet this test of legality, necessity, proportionality, and legitimacy. And this means several things. It means that any burden on privacy or freedom of expression must be provided or prescribed by law. It has to be precisely drafted to give the subject of regulation notice, but also to limit the discretion of the state to impose any burden. It also means that the restriction must be the least intrusive of all the available tools uh, to the state and that it impose no greater, no greater burden than what is necessary. Like that the burden doesn't eliminate the right in its entirety. So if you are actually, yeah, any, any restrictions to those rights cannot um, just eliminate the provisions or the guarantees of freedom of expression and privacy. And it also means that the ends must be legitimate. The ends of why you are restricting those rights might be legitimate. And there's where you have um, national, for the protection of the rights of others, national security, public order, right? Like, and, and all of these standards, they're cumulative, right? The attacker cannot simply say, for example, that the restriction is for national security, they must demonstrate each of these conditions, right? Like the state has to demonstrate. Um, and I'll move quickly here. And for example, this 2019 report also addresses um, the relationship between the public and the private sector, right? Like how governments are buying, uh, are buying spyware produced by private companies, but also the set of human rights uh, um, the set of human uh, human rights uh, um, obligations from states when they have to protect everyone within their jurisdiction. So, for instance, interference without privacy and an obligation that just should be understood to include transnational surveillance threat. But also, we 
we, uh, we talk, that report talks about the UN guiding principles and on business and human rights. And we're talking about human rights responsibility of, of companies and how they, um, companies have a responsibility to prevent or mitigate human rights harms in their activities um, and how they can mitigate those harms how, and how they can contribute, how they're contributing to the harm in human rights, right? So there's a bunch of information about that, the human rights responsibilities of, of private companies, but also it mentions a little bit of export controls, like export controls as an important element in one of the multiple pronged uh, strategies that we need to, um, yeah, that we need to have to address the spyware threat. Um, so export control is one of the elements to the reduce the risk caused by private surveillance industry. Uh, in that report, we talked about the Vassenaar Agreement. That is, um, it's a relevant international export control regime. It's non-binding, it's voluntary, and it talk, it's about the export control on conventional arms and dual-use goods and technologies. A little bit over 40 states participate, and it, it is tailored to reduce the threats to regional and international security. We talked about that, that for to be a possible avenue it has some complications uh, there. But um, in that report in 2019, the UN Special Rapporteur called, not, not only his call back then was not merely tighter regulation on surveillance exports and the restrictions of their use, but on I, he talked about an immediate, immediate moratorium on the global sale transfer of the tools of the private surveillance industry until Human rights safeguards are put in place to regulate uh, to regulate such practices. After that, the conversation has moved forward. I think now we understand from 2019 until now, we've understood these tools a little bit better. And even David Kay has has um, I, I would say evolved or just uh, yeah. Now that we understand this this surveillance tools and the ones that we are, they're new ones. They are casting and civil society experts around the world are casting doubts and even um, that surveillance technology, technology similar to Pegasus that even they, they might not even pass that test of international human rights. Like the, that the way that the, how intrusive they are and how this surveillance just violates and vulnerable, uh, yeah, violates human rights. That's how pervasive they are and how much access they can have in someone else and someone's uh, information and, and life, um, even like they might not be even considered lawful and they're calling for a ban. It's not just, it's not, we're not talking more anymore necessarily a moratorium. That's like the, le the, that's at least we can do a moratorium, but they're talking about the ban. It can, it, they will never pass the necessity and proportionality test, right? There are other ways to achieve the goal of national security. There are other ways to achieve those public interest that they're trying to achieve um i would leave it there uh yeah. right now uh, that question Sophia, I, I was also <laughs> wondering so you, you've, you've done a great job of, of describing uh these international legal uh, norms that are out there and are part of conventions that have been adopted um or treaties that have been adopted i'm, I'm curious if you could also talk to us about the recent work of the European Parliament and and their I think it's commonly referred to as their Pegasus Committee that has looked at this. Yeah, the Pega Committee. Can you tell us a yeah, little so, bit about that? Yeah, broadly, like um, so last year, April last year, and I it's it was also because of the revelations of the Pegasus project, um, and like yeah the what the revelation of the pegasus projects and how the the software was used by european um states they created this pega committee to examine the use of pegasus and also equivalent surveillance spywares across europe it was not just about pegasus it was a broader it had a broader scope they organized public hearings they did fact-finding missions they looked into different issues different topics of the human impact of spyware, the um, like how spyware market functions, the like how tech companies have responded to these issues, the digital security procedures and law enforcement enforcement practices. They they addressed a lot of different issues, um, 
I would say that like one of the like biggest breakthroughs, and this has been uh, said by organizations like Access Now and, and Amnesty International, that one of the biggest, not, I don't know, breakthroughs are, it's that the PEGA committee got NSO group to confirm on the record that at least four, I, it was about 14 EU um, European Union countries included Poland, Hungary, Spain, Belgium, Netherlands, they purchased Pegasus. So they got, they have that on the record. They also even admitted um, that its product, uh, they, they sold product to 22 end user agencies, uh, users in the member state, just suggesting that in one country, maybe multiple authorities or intelligence agencies might be using those, those technologies too. But to like more recent news, last week, May 9, they issued their final report, right? Uh, they delivered that report and it's not legally binding. It still needs to go to the, to the whole parliament, um, but it, like, it concluded 14 months of this investigation. It, is, it highlights the abuses of the commercial spyware. It talks about um, the consequences that it has had, how it had eroded democracy and rule of law. In, and it, like, yeah, the rule of law and democracy in general, how corrosive this uh, spyware is. It does fall short, short on calling for a more immediate moratorium on the sale of acquisition, transfer, and use of the spyware. It introduces like a condition-based moratorium. So the, the, they have one, the member states have one year, I think until the end of this year to, to see if they comply for this, like they have, a four, they have four requirements, specific for, four conditions to fulfill in order to be allowed to use spyware. And it talks about like the investigation and resolution of spyware abuse cases, the alignment of their national framework with international human rights law and standards. Um, they have some commitment on involving Europol in their investigation and also to repeal export licenses that will be that will not be compliant with EU law. So it has this like four set of, of conditions that they have to abide by. So this is just broad strokes to a lot of things that happened over the last 14 months. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of activity in this area. Uh, Antoine, I see that you had your uh, hand raised. Did you have a, a comment in reaction to a speaker's comment or in reaction to one of the questions that's been posed by audience members? You, uh, well, yes, I had uh, um, a reaction to one point just uh, now made by by Sofia, and maybe to to feed the further conversation, maybe uh, because uh, uh, we've had very broad and comprehensive uh, analysis from the human rights law standpoint. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, now, if you if we take a kind of broader view of of, of uh, how the problem uh, revealed has been uh, answered to in terms of one measure saying uh, second uh, regulation developments. I feel, I don't agree that th th there's been in fact uh, improved uh, answers, but I'm not sure it's what I, I, I understood correctly. I think the gap, the gap has been maintained uh, between the problem and the answer. Yes, there is increased understanding uh, and uh, sensitivity to the problem, yet uh, <laughs> very, very, very poor answers to that, including legal. Uh, the PEGA committee uh, is kind of the ultimate <laughs> last, very last chance to propel some legal developments uh, two years after the scandal. And uh, um, unless on very specialized uh, topics like the protection of journalism and the media, because there's an opportunity in the drafting of a specific EU law right now. But otherwise, all the, all the fantastic recommendations uh, that have been backed up by NGOs that have been propelled by UN Special Rapporteurs, starting with David Kay in his absolutely brilliant 2019 report that emanated from a broad consultation as Sofia knows very well and and really it was a great report with very very clear-cut recommendations 
basically none of which have been implemented. Sanctions against NSO, no. Moratorium on the sale of surveillance technology, no. Stricter international regulation of spyware, uh, including the Vassenar arrangement on dual use uh, product and uh, on the export of dual use product and technology, no. Uh, increased opposability of the uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights and applicability uh, domestically? No. There have been some domestic laws uh, adopted uh, about business corporations and human rights uh, uh, issues, but it's focusing on due diligence and it has not a specific approach most of the time on the surveillance related issues. Expansion from dual use regulation approach uh, which, as I said, is very poor, to a broader cyber surveillance approach that would allow including many other problematics beyond dual use? No. So, I mean, we, we are far from, we, we are far from an appropriate answer. In the meantime, in the meantime, NSO is developing it now, now, today, its own advocacy in the US Congress, in the United Nations, et cetera, et cetera. It's playing okay. So exactly. we are, there is a real uh, 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 gap, a real democratic gap, in fact, in the, in the non-answer that has been brought to that uh, situation. So Sophia, I'd, I'd love to hear your reaction to that. And, no, and, and I com I, yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I completely agree. Like the, the and I think, and I wouldn't speak, I wouldn't dare to speak by, for David, but, I think there is an agreement in a sense that those recommendations have not, like I won't repeat what Antoine just said, the recommendations that he made in 2019 have not been complied. Like there, and not only those recommendations, just basic human rights um, assessments or recommendations and implementations on this area, they have not, like states have not complied with it. And um, yeah, so it, and we have, and not only that, like we have like that part of like a broader government response to the threat. We have some, some responses from the US, some uh, that I think we're going to touch upon like, in the next panel, uh, in the next session or question, set of section uh, questions. But there's also a lot of, a lot that needs to happen internally in, in the country, and not just about surveillance, but like if we, we need like radical legal reform of surveillance practices and law, like removals of barriers of sovereign immunity. We need a lot of different, um, this is a, such a big problem <laughs> that it needs a multi-pronged um, response. It, it needs a global response. We need at a local level, a regional, international level. There have been uh, conversations about whether we should go through the route of a treaty, of, of a treaty right? Others say like, we're not in that, we're not in that scenario right now, but maybe we can engage with the export control. Maybe we can also keep analyzing the impacts on, on human rights defenders and journalists. Like we need to go deeper in understanding those impacts and let's engage into strategic litigation to maybe we can have a, like a de jure moratorium in, in different states, right? Like if we are successful with that litigation and they're, a little bit of restrictions in, in different states, which like the strategic litigation of those cases. It is difficult. It is. It has a lot of different restrictions. Antoine uh, touched upon some of the big legal hurdles that a lot of uh, lit litigators around the world are facing. So, yes, I, it is a complex problem. Recommendations have been done, I, and we need legal, more political engagement from states. The PEGA committee might propel some of those regulations that Antoine is suggesting. Um, so it's let's still have we need to have we still need to have all of these type of conversations, innovate in the answers that we need. And we can talk about that at the end. I don't want to take too much time. Yeah. Yeah, well, here I'll, I'll throw this question out to the two of you or any of the other panelists who would like to address it. Uh, you know, one thing you mentioned, Sophia, that came out of the PEGA committee is the large number of states in the EU that are using, that are making use of this type of spyware or, you know, they would say anti-terrorism purposes or anti-crime purposes. And it, I, I guess it raises the question, are, are we not seeing any action 
on regulating this type of spyware because so many countries are addicted to it or are, are, are using it um, as part of their anti-terrorism or anti-crime efforts. And, and if so, how do we get past that issue? I, I want to yeah. hear you. Yeah. No, no, I, I think uh, very clearly the gaps that we were referring to and what you are just referring to, Grant, highlight the need for ongoing increased expo reporting and exposure. Uh, and actually, uh, th there is some ongoing uh, exposure. We have scandal after scandal. There's a really great job that is being developed. And Siena can, can, can refer to that. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, um, because of the work of, of Citizen Lab in particular, uh, uh, as long as there is no proper answer. Now, certainly, uh, some governments, we are speaking about EU governments, uh, uh, it, it's quite shocking crime coming from them because they're sp supposed to be democratic. Now, we know that democracy is, is quite a relative concept. And, and be, be it from Hungary or from Germany, the question of having secret security services resorting to such technology has been raised. Now, what is new, and that's good, is that after the reach of the exposures, uh, um, governments feel the need to justify. I mean, democratic, really genuinely democratic governments. Or Orban would say that he's proud of doing it and he's no, can, not accountable to anyone, but be it in Germany or in Greece, in Greece, there is a strong public debate about uh, about predators uh, resorting to predators by, by national security, especially in a context where last year a journalist was murdered, even if it has nothing to do uh, with with the, the use of surveillance is an overall environment that is weakening, that is shaking about the practice of journalism, combining all this together, a surveillance, a murder of a journalist investigating the mafia, slaps, uh, etc. So it's really stress uh, 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 an environment that that uh, um, is um, is weakening governments having to justify themselves, which is, which is good, yet not yet moving to uh, updating regulation. Now, uh, in France, uh, the scandal, the package scandal, led to identifying that even the the, the president of, of of the French Republic was under surveillance. And I just said that today we've learned that the then Minister of Defense was also. Uh, uh, all together with other ministers. So um, I would expect that those governments don't try to get rid of the problem by undercover negotiation with the state of Israel, but go through updating public regulation. This would be what we expect. Now, our, our main chance to get to this are very limited in our analysis. It's one, the result from our criminal litigation in France and the judicial investigation that is pursuing, that is continuing. Second, the result from the PEGA committee, it's a very little chance. Uh, and third, the European Media Freedom Act that at least uh, 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 as journalists are concerned, may help pave the way for increased legal protection on those type of actors that do pursue a public interest function like journalists. And maybe after that, lawyers and human rights defenders, et cetera. Excellent. Sienna, I, did you have a reaction to this issue? Um, no, I would just uh, echo a lot of what Antoine said. I think it's tempting sort of like, I get asked this question a lot. And I think the sort of premise is like, we have to capitulate. There's nothing that can be done. Um, security services will behave as they do. And we sort of just have to accept the state of affairs. I mean, I think that's just not the case. And in democratic governments in particular, um, there is this process for the public to, to hold security agencies, intelligence agencies to account and for the legislative process to sort of put in place the accountability structure and the transparency structure that's necessary if this technology is going to be used in an accountable manner. And also to Sophia's point earlier, I think there does need to be a discussion for a total ban on certain types of spyware. For example, the Pegasus spyware, just like a complete take everything. There's no limitations. We're not necessarily very clear on what the safeguards are, whether there's auditing and so on. So that discussion continues. I think the, the harder one maybe is in authoritarian states where there just isn't this democratic environment where there could be a legislative process that would lead to, to accountability and to safeguards. And I think the goal there is to prevent um, 
uh, these governments from accessing this technology. And I realize that will be very difficult because if, you know, if the, if Europe, for example, imposes export restrictions on technology coming from um, European companies, others may sort of enter the market, but I still think this is a very a key component. So, so Europe, for example, Canada, the US, they all play a very important part in ensuring that this technology that is developed within their jurisdictions is not then exported, for example, to Saudi Arabia to be used against human rights defenders. Um, and this requires not just saying, oh, to companies, you know, you should behave this way. Here are the United uh, Nations guiding principles in business and human rights, but actually legislating accountability um, enforcing export licensing, not just turning a blind eye to it because it's good business, um, and really ensuring that corporate responsibility is in law so that there are sanctions. And, you know, if if you're not complying, that there are actually, um, there's actually an outcome in not complying um, a sanction against you. So I think, th yeah, those are my my quick, uh, quick responses to that. Great, that's very helpful. Well, I, I want to turn now from the international sort of focus, and, and thank you very much, Sophia, for your for your comments on that and bringing us up to speed there, uh, to more of a country specific focus. And we obviously don't have time to explore every country where this is a potential issue, uh, but we do want to take a, a bit of a deep dive into what's going on in the UK. Uh, we have with us, as I mentioned earlier, Ian DeFreitas, uh, who is a privacy specialist at a London law firm. And Ian, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, what we've seen in the UK in the way of court cases that, that deal with this issue? Yeah. So, um, I mean, just developing something that um, Sophia touched upon, which is state immunity. There, there have been some positive developments in the UK um, in the last year in two cases where the English court has addressed the question of whether the deployment of um, spyware um, in the UK um, is subject to state immunity when it's a foreign state. Uh, and in both cases, that the court rejected state immunity for the states concerned as a preliminary issue. And those cases are continuing, so they've been allowed to continue um, and it's very important decisions because as far as I'm aware, there's first time in the UK that individuals have confirmed these private rights of action in such cases. So, I mean, having said that, the onus has been on the individuals to bring these cases, supported by um, others, of course, but but the onus is on the individual. I'll come back to the some of the state issues and the UK issues more broadly a bit later on in this. But I, I just want to take a little bit of a deep dive into these two cases because it's important to understand why the decisions were made, but also their limitations. It's very important to understand the limitations, which I will get to. So the, the first case was in August last year, and it involved a critic of the uh, Saudi government. And um, he's pursuing a claim that his iPhones were hacked using uh, Pegasus spyware. Now, none of that is admitted by the Saudi government. Um, what the Saudi government tried to do at an initial stage was have the claim dismissed on the basis of our State Immunity Act, which um, um, uh, stems from 1978. So it might be slightly out of date, and we might get to that. But uh, but there we are, it's 1978. Uh, and that provides for state immunity from a UK court jurisdiction, uh, but is then subject to a list of specific exceptions. And one of those exceptions is that um, there's no immunity in cases of uh, personal injury or damage to tangible property, which is caused by an act or omission in the UK. So that's that's pretty much what the statute says. So, so in this case, um, what the claimant did was he tailored his case to allege personal, in personal injury. Um, and he said that as a result of the misuse of his private information and also the harassment that he felt, um, that led to psychiatric injury. That's the that's the base of the claim, and um, and the judge ac accepted that and dismissed the Saudi government's uh, immunity claim. T two elements of this are particularly important. Um, first, the Saudi government argued that allegations of spying on one of its political opponents are inherently sovereign or governmental; they're not private actions. And uh, they said the exception was really directed towards private actions. That was wholly rejected by the judge. He said, no, um, that's not what the State Immunity Act says. There's no such limitation. There are similar limitations in other parts of the act, but that's not what our legislature said. So rejected that out of hand. That's a great test case point. Um, 
Secondly, the Saudi government, um, which is a more difficult point, claimed that the exception to immunity meant that all of the activities that led to the injury had to take place in the UK. And the hacking was alleged to have been started from outside the UK, but affected the devices in the UK. Uh, and the judge, but the judge also rejected that. And this is very important as well. He said it was a sufficient, it was sufficient that a substantial and effective cause of the damage occurs in the UK, such as the extraction of private information from the iPhones. So, so if very importantly, um, this case established that a foreign state will not be immune from legal action in the UK if it initiates the hacking, um, the hacking from um, from outside the UK provided there are, the, it impacts in the UK. So it's very important. Then we had a very similar second case in February 2023, uh, funnily enough, before the same judge. Um, so you can imagine the way it went. But this was the Bahraini government. Um, and uh, this was two claimants, uh, commenced proceedings on a similar basis, uh, seeking, seeking damages for a personal injury arising out of the harassment that they felt because of their phones were hacked. And this was a um, spyware called um, a Fin Spy. Sienna might be more familiar with that than I am. But um, anyway, Bar Bahraini government this time. Again, uh, this was a preliminary issue, state immunity, uh, and uh, again rejected by the judge. Um, the, the tweak in this case was that the Bahraini government said that psychiatric injury doesn't constitute personal injury. That was their argument wholly rejected by the judge based on the evidence that he'd heard from uh, an expert witness uh, and therefore um, therefore rejected that claim. So these cases are um, very good in the sense that they give uh, individuals rights of action in certain circumstances, but but only where there's personal injury or potentially where there's damage to, to, to tangible property. Um, and so that might not help journalists, for example, because journalists may feel sufficiently robust to say, I didn't feel like I was so uh, affected that it had some sort of psychiatric injury on me. Uh, and in fact, Antoine sort of um, uh, touched on that. And it certainly doesn't help in relation to um, issues like uh, Sophia was talking about, the deprivation of rights to freedom of expression, that those those inherent rights, those, those non-physical rights, if you like, they are, they are not subject to this exception in the State Immunity Act. So one of the things maybe I think maybe in the UK we could think about looking at, given that this act that dates back to 1978, is does it need updating in the context of what's happening with spyware? There is, there is no indication of that at the moment, um, but it does seem to me it's something that people might well well push on. One of the things you know we've heard about from other commentators is the attribution problem, right? the difficulty of figuring out who it is exactly that um tried to install this spyware on, yeah. on someone's device have have the uk courts in these cases had to deal with yeah. that problem is it but, an issue and and how how have they dealt with it it, it, it is an issue uh, and uh, i'm pleased to say uh, sienna's colleagues dealt with it in these two cases citizen lab um the court requires expert evidence um the court doesn't have its own investigators it it, it uh, you need to have expert evidence and the, 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 the parties who are making the claims um, call the expert evidence. They they instruct their own experts who seek to persuade the court. Uh, and the way it works, it's adversarial normally. So the, the governments will call their own experts to say it wasn't them. Um, in these cases, the court was satisfied that there was enough of a case to demonstrate that it was these two governments that have been doing the hacking. That is not finally determined, though. It's only that there has to be a substantial case that that has been established for it to go to a trial. So that still is to be finally determined. But um, but um, uh, uh, yeah. So it will it will rely upon expert evidence. Basically, it, it will not investigate it for, on its on its own. That's not what the court does, and not the function of the court. You know, another issue that I think has come up in some cases around the world is. The question of what can you do with illegally obtained evidence or unlawfully obtained evidence, and yeah. and here you might have a very specific example of that, where um, if a commercial actor, for example, or a private citizen were able to get a hold of this technology, they might be able to uncover facts that would be very useful to their case. Yeah, can they use them in court? 
Well, you might be surprised to hear um, in, in England, where we're you know very hot on the rule of law, the answer is yes, you can rely upon hacked evidence in certain circumstances, even if it's the claimant that's hacked the evidence and is relying on it. So as an example, there was a, there was a case uh, a couple of years ago where the English Court of Appeal was asked to overturn a trial judge's decision to admit the hacked evidence. It was in a fraud case. And... Um, and uh, and you might have thought that, um, particularly being American, that um, that sort of thing would not be allowed. Yeah. Um, but but the court said the court said, look, if the evidence is relevant, they they will often admit it. But there's a balancing exercise that needs to be carried out. How important is the evidence, uh, and what are the allegations concerned? Now now in this particular case, the court said that the evidence was hacked emails. Was emails hacked from the defendant? which demonstrated the fraud that was alleged. And without those hacked emails, the claimant wouldn't have been able to, to demonstrate that you know, the, thought, the fraud had occurred, or that was the argument. And the Court of Appeal agreed with the trial judge that in those circumstances, the hacked evidence could be relied upon. And I know that, sound, and as I say, I know that sounds quite surprising. For, for me personally, this is my own personal opinion, I do have great difficulties with these sorts of decisions because I think... It encourages people to hack information. Uh, and the case you were talking about at the beginning, the case that I dealt with, um, is, goes back about a decade now, was exactly that, where information was stolen from my client without his permission from his computer systems. And, and we managed to get it back in that case. But that was only because the, the, the amount of information that was taken was so egregious. And the courts um, accepted that it was too early in the process because my client was under an obligation to disclose information anyway. And that obligation had not arisen. So, so you know, these cases go either way. But I really don't like the fact that our our courts are still of the view, and I think it's about I think it's a bit old fashioned that you can hack information and then rely on it. I, I really don't like it. I think I share your your view on that, Ian. <laughs> yeah. But let me let me uh, ask you before we uh, switch to uh, the rest of the panelists um, on on what we should do next. What are regulators or legislators in the UK doing about this issue, if anything? Yeah, well, the, the, the answer to that is is not very much. I mean, just drawing on, on the previous discussions that were had bef before I, I came into the conversation, we do have very strict laws in the UK around what the government can do and what our law enforcement authorities can do in terms of hacking. It is lawful to hack, but you have to... Um, uh, satisfy necessity tests, which um, Sophia was 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 referring to, uh, and you also have to have um, oversight by um, uh, judicial authorities effectively. And there's also an annual review of the the use of these powers. There are lots of checks and balances in the UK around that. That actually was driven by partly by the EU when we were in the EU. Um, we were seen as the bad boys in terms of doing these things. We were we were we were the EU's bad boys in terms of surveillance and everything else as a, as a state. Uh, and gradually we were we were pushed kicking and screaming down the track towards a more balanced approach, which complied with the EU Charter. Since we've left the EU, we're be, again being uh, dragged kicking and screaming down down the road because if we want to keep exchanging data with the EU. We have to have nearly equivalent provisions in relation to what we do on state security issues. So, so, so we are still being pushed down that road, and we've still got um, pressure there to do the right thing. So, if the UK government was using um, spyware, and I'm not aware that we're using this particular spyware, Pegasus, but, but if we were, then um, you know it is supposed to be subject to these checks and balances. I have to say, we have all sorts of very sophisticated ways of hacking people. Uh, we probably don't need the spyware, to be honest, but I'm not a, I'm not a, an expert on what the spooks do. But anyway, um, just in terms of um, uh, what, what is happening here in terms of the reaction to spyware more specifically, uh, two things really to mention. First, we've got the National Cyber Security Center. They are our guardians of our national infrastructure when it comes to cyber attacks. So if there's a major attack on the UK, they get involved. That's, that's one of the key functions they perform. And every so often they bring out um, reports on key threats. And there was a report issued last month, which included um, issues about spyware. 
And um, they express concern that uh, the use of spyware like Pegasus is lowering the barriers to entry for bad actors to spy on others and also represents a national a cybersecurity threat to the UK if this is used by hackers or those who support them. Um, and their um, rather gloomy prediction was that over the next five years, they are expecting to see an expansion in global uh, commercial cyber intrusion because of the use of this sort of technology. Uh, and that obviously represents a threat to everybody, it represents a threat to lawyers, represents a threat to all sorts of sectors, to journalism, et cetera. And then the UK government has also expressed concerns. Um, there were lots of speeches been made. Uh, there was one um, last month by Oliver Dowden, who's now the Deputy Prime Minister. And um, uh, I'll read you the quote, actually. He said, um, uh, there's a new front opening as we see more adversaries able to buy and sell sophisticated spyware like Pegasus, which can cause the UK serious damage. So that's his specific quote. Um, now, the issue is, however, that the UK government is not doing a lot about it at the moment. Um, there's, there's no sort of concerted activity to, to address spyware in particular. It's, it's true that they are looking at um, revising one of the major anti-hacking legislations. We have a, an act that goes back to 1990, again, a bit out of date, the Computer Misuse Act. Um, and what's proposed there are tougher prison sentences. Um, and there's a suggestion as well that the moment the offence is committed, if you access a computer without permission, that includes a mobile phone, by the way, um, what they're thinking of doing is extending that to using the product of that access. So the information that you steal um, is also, once you use it or begin to use it, it's a an, it's an criminal offence as well. Um, so that might be an, a reform which comes through, which would be used against uh, commercial um, users of, or, of spyware to put them under pressure, uh, subject, of course, to us having jurisdiction over them. And, and being able to, you know, enforce whatever action we take in the UK, uh, or or possibly transport that abroad to other countries who are sympathetic. So um, there are things going on. Um, in my view, not enough. It's not joined up enough. Um, and you know, I expressed the same concerns as the rest of the panel did that we're a little bit behind the curve, and we need to we need to catch up with all of this. Well, that's a great segue to my my next set of questions, which are, you know, have to do what uh, have to do with what should we do going forward? How how should we uh, start to catch up with the technology and, and the challenges that they raise? Sienna, maybe I'll start with you on this one. What I mean at a at high level, before we get into the details of specific measures we can take at a high level. What should be the objective of regulation? Should we be seeking to get rid of this type of uh, surveillance spyware entirely? Or should we be trying to better balance the national security and anti-crime interests with the concerns about uh, abuses of human rights and, and invasion of the attorney-client privilege and so on and so forth? What, what should we be aiming for here? So I think this uh, goes back to some points raised earlier by Sophia, but I think the moratorium really has merit. Um, and that's to sort of stop the current acceleration of events where we're seeing more and more instances of spyware abuse so that there can be a proper and robust discussion um, about what the legislative safeguards need to be uh, when and if this technology is used. So that's one part. And I think at the same time, there needs to be this parallel discussion about if spyware is going to be um, one of the tools in the sort of surveillance arsenal of, of national security agencies, um, police departments, and so on, uh, what types of spyware are simply just unacceptable? They're such, they present such a threat to human rights, to rule of law and democracy um, in how they function, in in the information they take from phones, in the, the risks that they raise, um, uh, that they simply shouldn't shouldn't be allowed. So that's sort of the ban discussion, I think that Sophia mentioned earlier, which I, I, I do think needs to be focused on more. And I think the European Data Protection um, Supervisor, have that right, the EDPS, put out a, uh, an initial comment on Pegasus, which I thought was extremely helpful and sort of centers the discussion around, around that. 
Um, and then, you know, going forward, so from the moratorium to sort of a legislative a framework that prevents the abuse of this technology, which has to not only be domestic, so domestic domestic law, but also looking at, um, I think, something more comprehensive, an international treaty, for example, that puts as many states as possible on the same page with regards to the use of this technology, when it can be used, what the accountability and, and transparency framework should be around its domestic and transnational use is critical. Um, and there are so many different points that need to be addressed. That's probably not, maybe my colleagues will get into more specific points, um, including, for example, enhanced protections for certain persons. Um, so I think that's that's sort of that component of it. I think civil society continues to play a really important role in, in this discussion um, and in pushing things along. I think without the work of civil society, we wouldn't be having this discussion at all. So this includes research groups and non-governmental organizations, journalists who are absolutely critical in ensuring accountability. So um, there, the work by the Citizen Lab as well, but there's many others um, who have done extensive investigations into this technology, not only the forensic side, but also the impacts um, of this technology on rule of law and democracy. I think that needs to continue to be front and center in this discussion. Um, and civil society should continue to push for the moratorium and push for an ultimate ban on certain types of spyware um, and continue to raise issues in, in both domestic and international settings. And then we also have sort of the third pillar of responses, which is that of the um, the obligations of spyware companies themselves, and I think there's been a lot of reference to their need to comply with the UNGPs, and I think that makes sense, but I think ultimately it needs to be a legislative issue. It can't just, we can't just expect companies, um, especially spyware companies whose sort of business model is complete lack of transparency to comply with any sort of soft law, soft norms. So there needs to be actual regulation that is then enforced. That's a lot to ask for, of course, um, but I think I, so having sort of entered the space in 2018, um, after leaving private practice, I think it's been really interesting to see how the discussion has really accelerated. So if you go back a few years, we, this discussion probably wouldn't be happening. Um, sort of this like cross section of people wouldn't be meeting this, there wouldn't be such significant interest. So I think we are moving to, uh, to a place where there's greater public awareness um, of the dangers presented by this technology and also all surveillance technologies, right? Like spyware is just sort of one segment of this growing market. Um, so I think that's really promising. And for example, the work of the PEGA committee, there's been a lot of criticism, but that's been very central, I think, in advancing um, what is going on in Europe and sort of doing this extent of fact finding that's necessary that can then be built on for a legislative response and international response. So I don't want to sort of like end my notes in a pessimistic um, <laughs> pessimistic tone, but rather point out that there has been growing acceleration in interest, um, both by civil society, but also by governments. Uh, there's been a bunch of action in the US recently regarding spyware and addressing uh, for example, the the putting in a so group, for example, on the entity list. Um, so there have been, you know, we are seeing we are seeing more and more regulatory measures. So I think there's something significant to to be building off, and to obviously there's a lot that needs to be done and to continue building forward. And Sophia, do you do you share uh, Sienna's perspective on there being a need for a moratorium and and that being an appropriate solution? Yes, no, I agree uh, on how she characterized it. Like it, we're talking about a moratorium on some sort of surveillance uh, tools, right? But and like stricter regulations on that, and talking about the, um, if we're talking about like um, export control, like genuine transparency and oversight, like that type of moratorium, until we have a human rights. Um, abiding rules in, set, in in place right and I also agree with what she just said except like I, I wouldn't I don't want to repeat it like if we are talking about a, a ban on specific types of spyware like Pegasus that are just com that are completely incompatible with uh, international human rights law and I would push for that ban and I and I she put it cre very clearly <laughs> like if we're if we talk about like the U.S. Uh, inclusion of NSO group into the entity list, that suggests that that suggests and that suggests a little bit of a step towards a ban of such technologies. Like it's it's a it's a good step into that way to that uh, scenario. But yeah, no, I I wouldn't I wouldn't want to repeat. So yes, I agree with that. Well, me, Moratorium me, me to some of them, understanding uh, understanding what we're talking about, like 
she said, like there are some surveillance technologies that can be regulated, some surveillance technologies that are well, are useful for some of those public interest goals. And uh, if we have in place some, um, yeah, some standards and some protections to safeguard the rights of others, we can have them. We can have those surveillance. We have to have a rule of law. We have to have some set of guidelines for those. But there are some others that just are definitely not compatible with, with, yeah, with no one's story yet. Got it. You know, one one point that I su I suppose defenders of this technology would make about uh, a moratorium is that it might prohibit governments from being able to um, learn about communications that are occurring through encrypted chats, for example, between those who are organizing a terrorist attack or who are participating in a pedophile ring. How would, are there alternatives for dealing with that issue if we were to have a moratorium on this sort of surveillance spyware? So I, I, I can chip in on that. I, I, I think the answer is, uh, well, at the commercial level, you ban it. It's like it's like bad AI, which is going to be banned under the EU AI Act. You just ban it. When it's state use, you bring it firmly within the existing protections that exist within the EU sphere. And, and I have to say now in the UK, we have a better regime than we once had. And if you're going to use it, you have to use it subject to the very strict requirements around necessity. So you're talking about uh, use cases which um, are, you know, re against really bad actors. It, that can be justified, but you've got to go. You've got to jump through all of those hoops before you use it. So bring it in. To make sure it's firmly within the existing regimes. If they're still not strong enough because of the type of technology it is, then you enhance. And there should be an intergovernmental intergovernmental discussion about that. The problem is, though, Grant, that it, within the EU, the UK, maybe the US, maybe some one of a few a few other countries, you know, Australia, etc., New Zealand, um, that might work. But it's just out there in so many different countries now, trying to get the sort of the cross border consensus and all of this is going to be, I think, impossible. But we could start at home, if you know what I mean, and then and see what happens. What we could do, of course, is what we do with uh, what we try to do with the Americans in terms of transatlantic data transfers. If you don't if you don't adopt our norms in these sorts of areas, then we're not giving you our data, which sort of, you know, focuses minds to an extent. So there are different ways to pull some levers on this, but um, it's going to be difficult to get the international consensus. And particularly because a lot of countries that never had this capability. The Brits have had it, the Americans have had it, uh, other countries have had it. But but some of the, let's say, less developed countries now have this capability and, and they may say, well, why do I want to give it up now I've got it? Now I've got it. So, you know, there's that aspect to it as well. You know, another question I wanted to put to the panel was there, there may be- I think people... Antoine has a, his hand. I'm sorry. To oh, I'm sorry, you. Antoine. I, I missed your hand there. Please. No, go it's ahead. okay. It's okay. Thanks, Grant. Yeah, I I I, I like to build on what Jan just said because um, with, with three ideas. The first one uh, is that maybe indeed uh, what we need relates to the legitimacy challenge. It's a political debate about what is legitimate and what is not. We take as granted that because such surveillance is fully illegitimate, the one we've been discussing it, this is shared by everybody. Whereas our democracies, if we speak as Ian was suggested, at least let's do at home and see what can be done, are confronted with some security, national security, whatever the framing of undue uh, 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 malicious uh, interference in their democratic spheres, there is a need, which is legitimate, to understand it, to get intelligence about it, for the democracies to protect themselves. 
So maybe there's a need for a political debate. It's, it's silly to say that because it should be granted, it should be done, it should be clear, but obviously it's not. Otherwise there would have been some regulation. Otherwise there would have been some moratorium. Otherwise there would have been some answers. So maybe just, okay, look, to highlight what is absolutely illegitimate surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. Well, to shed, to, to update the light uh, the, on the meaning of what is and what should be legitimate for security services. It's super difficult. We've tried to help such type of answer emerge from in Germany, from a litigation in the constitutional court in Germany about uh, the action of German foreign intelligence uh, and, and what is legitimate, not legitimate for them to be doing. We'll try to have the constitutional courts recognize that surveillance of journalists, be that German in Germany, foreign in Germany, German abroad or foreign abroad is never legitimate. And it's, it's difficult. Uh, the constitutional court was great, but then the, the parliament uh, updated the legislation one degree or two degrees lower than, than the jurisprudence from the, the constitutional court. So we are back in the constitutional court right now, and, and, but, but there's maybe something around the legitimacy question. Second, there is obviously an issue about strengthening the legality on the topic, the legality on the topic, starting with state responsibility and here we have one chance and this is at least from our our analysis and what we have invested a lot of time in which is the the negotiation of the european european media freedom act uh, uh, we refer in particular to one provision which is article 4 of the emfa which is extremely clear which uh, sets an an obligation from states not to subject to surveillance media journalists etc 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 not to deploy spyware in any device or machine used by media service providers the, uh, uh, unless justify on grounds of national security here again we have our problem the, the first point i referred to earlier what do we mean by this uh, uh, beyond the uh, uh, jurisprudence of the european court of human rights and, and, and other appropriate uh, uh, human rights bodies as domesticized third and of course, that 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 uh, increased legality, uh, up, uh, upgrading uh, uh, democratic law, should be based on proper upgrading of the implementation principles of necessity and proportionality. Of course, third, we have provisions. We all have, and under our respective domestic laws, and most of the time derived from international law criminal law provisions that are applicable to challenge the responsibility, the legal responsibility of individuals or even of corporations. And this is positive law that needs to be implemented. That's the basis we've used for our litigation in France with this judicial, ongoing judicial investigation. Uh, what I've been really struck by is how such efforts in other countries, because, because there, there have been tentatives in quite a number of countries, I think 10 or 12, uh, have not succeeded, have been easily broken. One way, Grant, you are referring to that, one, one very important condition to have such litigation succeed is to overcome the attribution challenge, to answer the attribution challenge. And this is where uh, we need very good, very good uh, uh, expert police or expert contributors like Citizen Lab uh, and others to come and feed those ongoing judicial processes. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I see that we unfortunately have reached the end of our allotted two hours. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion, and, and I feel like there's about a thousand more questions I, I could put to this group and would be fascinated in your answers to those questions. But thank you all uh, very much for walking us through this issue. And uh, thank you to our audience for joining the, the panel discussion today. Our rule of law webathon uh, does not stop with this particular panel. Uh, at uh, 1600 GMT, 
1800 Eastern time and uh, I'm sorry, Central European time and 12 o'clock PM Eastern Standard Time in the United States. Uh, I encourage you to join us for another interesting panel that's entitled Upholding the Rule of Law in Times of Armed Conflict, Acting in the Present, Preparing for the Future. Uh, to register for that program, uh, you can click on the link that has been posted in the chat box on this webinar, and that will take you uh, directly to the registration page. Thank you all uh, very much for joining us, and thank you again to our, our speakers and to our organizers and, and, and hosts uh, today uh, for this wonderful discussion.